<laughs> what's Hello. up? What's up? Not How you too feeling, much. Brother? How you doing? I'm good, man. Good. Before, good. Before, before we get started, I have to show you something. Well, you're gonna ask this question later, but this is in particular something that I have to show you. So watch this. So I'm in my home office. Nice. And on the wall, there's a calendar. And there's a poster. Does that poster look oh, familiar? Oh, look at you and me. You were so young. <laughs> <laughs> and still bald. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, and even right 18 years ago. It, right next to it yes. was the first time yes. we were both on, uh, I think this was Dan Chicago. So yeah, was that was Rhythm. Project Rhythm Productions, produced yeah. by our good friend Gina Barrera. See, Mad Rhythms and then special guest, Chicago uh, Top Theater. That's cool. So, I, all these that's have been really on my wall cool. for years, man. So I just thought uh -huh. I'd show you that. So I feel like at a certain point, I should show you what's on my wall. I'm going to, you and I are going to have, have a talk because I have that exact that same poster. Oh, do you? Nice. It's one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, so it's, it was just pretty cool. I noticed that. I was looking at the wall like I didn't even realize that I had posters with Chicago Tap Theater on it on oh, my wall. I love it. That's kind. Well, I'm honored. I really am. Well, so you answered my first question, which is tell everybody where you are. What city are you in? Oh, I'm in Chicago. That's right. Chicago. Chateau. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I'm I'm at home today. I'm at my home office, and you can see the walls are, if you see them behind me, yeah. are full of all kind of stuff. Tap, there's Gregory on the wall. Mm. There's some of Mad Rhythm's first shows on the wall. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's just you know, and then and then wait, I have to show you my special guest in my office. We'll turn the camera around one more time. And then under the table is this little baby <laughs> hanging out. Oh, and the name? That's Lacey. Lacey. Say hi, Lacey. Hi, Lacey. Say hi, Lacey. Oh, goodness. No. You like, just leave me alone. I was sleeping. Why would you disturb me like that? <laughs> oh, I love it. So cool. Uh, and what are you drinking right now? You got your mug? Well, I don't have a mug. That's all right. But I got a, um, this is just a chai tea. Nice. So it's a chai tea, uh, it's a chai, chai tea made with a uh, little almond milk. Hmm. Delicious. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump right in. You know, uh, I know that there's a lot of people that are tuning in today specifically because of the moment we're in and they, they're waiting for you and I to kind of talk about some more substantive things. However, I think it's important first that, that you get to talk about some of the things I ask everybody about because I want everyone to have an opportunity to get to know you the way that, that I've been lucky enough to get to know you over the years. Okay. So I'm going to ask you just a few kind of general hold questions. Hold on, hold on, Mark. Begin. I can barely hear you, and I'm not sure why. I think I, like a phone call tried to come through when I was logging on, and it dropped the volume. And I keep hitting my volume button, and it's not going up. Oh, and no. so I think I might have to come off and reconnect because well, this right is important. Ahead. So uh, yeah, I, hold, I'm going to I'm going to come out and then reconnect. Yeah, no worries. See you in a hot minute. All right. All right, I'm back. Right. How do I sound? <laughs> and you sound you sound wonderful. You sound very Yanali ish. <laughs> uh oh, I'm sorry. I can't help that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, saying hi to your mom on here. I didn't. Yeah, I was I like, Harvey that. Barrett, you have to be related. I was waiting on the connection. I was like, oh, he, he didn't know Mama Rhythms. He didn't know who Mama Rhythms was. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time then, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love that she knows how to use Instagram Live now. She's stepping her, she's stepping her technology game up. Love it. Love it. I think one of that's one of the interesting things about this pandemic is we've all kind of become IT people, right? Yeah, yeah, for real. Yeah, it's amazing. Real I know my, my mom every day is, okay, today you're on Instagram or you're on Facebook Live <laughs> or, or do I need to Zoom? 
Um, but she's there, man. Everything I do, I see. I see Nancy Onley. So. Yeah. That's very cool, man. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome to have you have your mom supporting you. Uh, aren't we lucky? I feel like oh, so yeah. many male dancers don't have that, right? Or mm -hmm. males, period. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm a self. I'm a self-professed mama's boy all day. Mm. I hear that. Yep, you and me both. You know, it's funny. We did that show. Oh, maybe six years ago, called Mama's Boy. Um, mm. Directed by Harrison McEldowney, who, by the way, said hi when was very excited about this interview. Yeah, um, yeah, and I ended up sitting Harrison down with Diane in. Walker. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I sat down with Diane Walker, and she told me about, uh, I believe she was telling me stories about Jimmy and how he was a self-professed -pro mama's boy. And she said, I mm -hmm. saw that name of your poster, and it made me think of Jimmy. And I thought, well, that's, that's about mm. as good a compliment mm. as you could ever hope to get. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Slav was definitely a mama's boy and was proud of it. Mm. So we're going to jump right in here. Um, okay. The first question I ask everybody, what was your first experience with tap dance? What's the first time you remember seeing it or doing it? Uh, so I never saw it before I did it. That was an interesting thing. Um, my mom put me in, and um, there was a community center. My mom put me in classes. And my first teacher, uh, we just took everything. So we tried tap. We tried um, different dance forms, uh, drama vocal lessons so it was just like a theater program in a community center um mm -hmm. called bbf uh then it was the better boys foundation now it's bbf family services but but i went there and my first teacher they were just like tap is one of the things you're gonna try so i tried it wow. and fell in and love with it i was gonna and say was it immediate it. yeah man like i knew i was like this like i enjoyed doing everything but this yeah. was a special kind of joy and i i, I kind of i had that inkling then do that you remember i know you were you were quite young but do you remember what it was about tap that really like grabbed you at first i'm always curious about that um I, I you know i don't know because it wasn't you know obviously we weren't doing improvisation or any of that stuff so it wasn't like the things that that make it dear to me now it wasn't that but I do remember the first routine I ever did was to Stevie Wonder, Sir Duke. So that 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 teacher, Carlton Smith, mm. that was the first. So I was introduced to Tap and Stevie Wonder at the same time. <laughs> wow. Now that's a heavy day. Um, but I just remember the way I felt when I did it, man. Like just the way I felt. I just wanted to keep keep that feeling. So uh, growing up, who were your primary mentors and teachers? And if you know, who were their teachers? I'm always curious mm -hmm. in the concept of the grand teacher. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, Carlton Smith was one of my, was my first teacher. And then uh, Ted Levy, who you all nice. may or may not, but should all know. Um, and then Mr. Taps. Those, oh, so yeah. I had three teachers early on. Now, Carlton Smith, I don't know much about his timeline because, and, and in later years, I've tried to, like, get back in touch with him and find out, but he kind of, I have never been able to find him. Mm -hmm. um, but Mr. Taps and, and, and then Ted Levy came out of the Sammy Dyer School of Theater. There's so much legacy in Chicago with that school. Um, and then Mr. Taps was taught by Jimmy Payne, who was one of Chicago's legendary tap dancers. Um, his son, Jimmy Payne Jr., tap dancers to this very day. His daughter, Sarah Payne, they all tap. Um, and, uh, but I know like, so Jimmy Payne and I, and Jimmy Payne moved to Chicago. I recently interviewed his children, which is why I feel great to know about like the places where my teachers came from to know a lot of those because history is important. So he moved to Chicago, um, later in his life and raised his family and started his school. Um, but I do not know. I believe I do not know his teacher because I think he was one of the people that was kind of just making it up as he was going along. A lot mm -hmm. of that was going on in the earlier days of tap. We'll get into all of that, of course, mm -hmm. but um, I have to, but let me not say anything that I don't know for fact, cause I sure. don't like facts being messed up. So I'm not quite sure who Jimmy Payne seniors teachers were. And I will 
And uh, oh, somebody said Jimmy is their grand teacher. So I will reach out to his son. I probably after I get off this call and be like, "Hey, who was your dad's teacher?" <laughs> I don't think we ever yeah. talked about that. I love it, and bro, I have to say, I yeah. also just saw Lisa Latouche on here, and I have to tell you, she is one of the many things that I also want to thank Mad Rhythms for because it was through Mad Rhythms that I think Lisa originally came to Chicago, and she yeah. just ended up being one of my very most favorite people on this planet. She really yeah. is, is one of the yeah, greatest. Yeah, so. Latouche is dopeness. <laughs> yeah, so, Lisa been in the family a long time. Yeah, it's deep. So is there anything a mentor ever said to you that has stuck with you all these years? Anything you hear in the back of your head? Um, well, the first thing that runs up right away is Dr. Slide saying mount to something mm. and talking about and talking about, you know, the elevation of, of yourself, what your aspirations are as a dancer. Um, and I loved it because when he first said it, this was in St. Louis at a panel and everybody was like, does he mean amount to something like and he's like, no, mount to something. Mm. And then he, Dr. Slide used to give you this look when he drop a ton of knowledge on you with one sentence or one word. And he just look at you like, you need to think about this. Let it, let it marinate, let it roll around in there for a minute. And so that has always stuck with me. I remember, this is the funniest. I remember seeing Dr. Leonard Reed, and this was also at the St. Louis Tap Festival. Um, Professor Robert Reed, rest in peace. Um, I remember seeing Dr. Leonard Reed and and he was talking to a bunch of young dancers and and he was so cool when he was older, he didn't want to use a cane. So he, he loved playing golf. So he used a golf club as his cane. So he would come, he would go play golf and then he would come back and he would keep one of the clubs out and walk with it as it came. And one day he stopped a, a, just a group of us in the, in the, in the lobby of the hotel where the St. Louis Tap Festival used to happen. And he said, Hey, and he set up like he was about to play golf and he teed up and we looking like what, what, what is going on? And, and it was, this was kind of around the time when, um, after Noise Funk had made made a real big splash on the tap scene, and a lot of young dancers, especially me included, I was saying, yo, we hit. Because Savion talked about hitting. Like, you got to hit that. There's a whole piece of Noise Funk about hitting. And um, I remember, so a lot of us were like, yeah, nah, we hit. We hit. And Slide ran that club back and swung it, and, and, and he said, you got to swing before yeah. you can hit something. And 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 uh, I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. I love that. Yeah. yeah I said Jimmy, Slide. I meant, know, say, I meant to say Dr. Doc, Dr. Reed. I, I got him. Slide was the first quote, Doc. But Slide always said that, too. So that's yeah. probably why I confused it. He talked about swinging. You got to swing before you can hit. That's right. I felt like every interaction I ever had with, with Dr. Slide was... Uh, and I don't want to get too deep, but it kind of felt like uh, a spiritual experience. He was one of those people that every anything he said had that multiple meaning, right? If you wanted to dig into it, you could chew on it for a while. Uh, yeah. He wasn't one with, at least with the conversations I ever had with him, he wasn't one prone to uh, idle chatter that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mm. felt like, you know, when he spoke, it was for a reason. Oh, yeah. And, and, it, and, and it was... Some of some of Slide's wisdom, like like he was truly a guru, man. Like some of his wisdom took years to hit you, and you'd be like, "Man, that just now fully connected." And um, so it's it's very yeah yeah. We live in a world, especially in an information age. Like I love to talk, and anybody who knows me knows I love to talk. But I think it's very it's very. Um, refreshing but also like mentally stimulating when someone can say very little but it sends your mind on a whirlwind of thought patterns like wow wow yes agreed so, yeah. agreed yeah so tell me this uh this is something that i'm also kind of interested in you know the word technique is one of those mm -hmm. words that i feel like in a lot of dance forms it has a very specific meaning and it's often mm -hmm. tied to a specific innovator Right, mm -hmm. Graham technique, Lamon technique. Um, what does technique mean to you within the context of tap dance? 
Uh, for me, technique is the execution of the steps. And so in terms of, I've never, let's see, what's a good way to look at it? When I, when I started judging competitions, I had a couple of years of my life where I was a judge on some of these co competitions and conventions. So I, I was in that world for quite a bit. And I remember always like one of the first like light bulb moments was realizing that all of these kids from all of these schools all over the country could tap well, like their technique, they, they weren't missing shuffles. They weren't, you know what I mean? So technically they were very proficient, but then I would see that same school and five routines later, they all look like the same routine. So I was like, Oh, the technique is strong here, but the creativity is not. Um, or the, the attack to the music is very basic, uh, on the, you know, on the count, on the count, there's no in between. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, rhythmicality going on. So there's a lot of things that I learned. And so for me, technique is important so that when you're creating, you don't have to think about what steps you're doing. Like, I don't think any of us, when we improvise, we're not trying to make sure that our shuffle connects or that our <laughs> flap ends where it's supposed to with the right rhythm we're making music and the technique has to be so second nature that you don't think about whether or not you missed a sound in your shuffle yeah and so yeah technique is extremely important as a ground as a ground but the problem is like what i is again a lot of people in certain aspects of the tap community deal with technique and nothing else Right. And so there's no growth, there's no musicality, there's no evolution yes. because none of the other elements are being attacked. So, yeah, technique is important, but it is one of many important things. Yes. So uh, have you ever had to come back from a major injury? Now, I actually know that. I remember when you were out oh, for a little yeah. bit. Do you <laughs> mind sharing a little bit about that? Because I always think it's important for people who are dealing with an injury to hear stories of people that have had one and come uh -huh. out the other side a better dancer than they went in. I think that's an inspiring mm, and mm. important message to hear when you're kind of at your depths with an injury. Yeah. Well, my back, my back was my injury. Um, I've suffered, you know, sprained ankles and stuff like that, but thank, thank God it was in my younger days when recuperation, like I remember being in river dance and spraining the an ankle and still going on stage. Like we, I sprained my ankle in the warm up room, just hitting back and forth and still went on stage. I remember being in Imagine Tap and spraining my ankle. And so like things like that, but man, when my, when my back went out, it was something that I don't think any dancer ever imagines. Not like you don't understand the power and the necessity of your back until you can't use it. And so I remember I was on stage. This was a dance Chicago show. I was on stage and I was dancing. And this is also why what you dance on is important. And that's a lesson I've had to learn going forward. Um, and that's also um, one of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's one of the luxuries that we have as a community that the early hoofers didn't. Mm. They had to dance on whatever they had to dance on, period. Yeah. But so for me, so in this particular show, the stage was covered in Marley, and it was a super thick Marley. Mm. And so as tap dancers in a general dance show, we complained about, you know, no wood, <laughs> but, you know, they weren't going to cater to us. And we didn't want to not do the show because we were tap dancers and a, and a multi-genre represented show. So we wanted to make sure we represented tap properly. But man, those thick Marley floors. So I remember, you know, Marley, Marley absorbed shock <laughs> and it absorbed sound. So yeah. Marley is a tap dancer's worst enemy. So I remember being on that floor and performing and doing my thing. And in the middle of dancing, there was a pop in my back. Just some said pop. And, you know, we as professionals, we're taught the show must go on. You know, if you're taught right, you're taught that the show must go on. So it hurt. And... But luckily, I was kind of in the middle of the performance, so the adrenaline was still pushing. And, man, I got through that performance. 
took my bow, walked off the stage, and I sat down. And when I sat down, man, my whole back locked up. And I couldn't get up. Like, backstage, I couldn't get up. So I sat there for a while. I was embarrassed. I was hurt. I didn't know what was going on. I was confused. You know, and people were talking to me, and I was holding conversations because I really didn't want people to know. And, you know, this is... This is this is ego. Sometimes, you know, we have it and we gotta and we gotta learn how to deal with it and navigate it. So I didn't want people to know I was really in pain. Um, and so I kind of sat there through the rest of the show. Uh on the stair. If you if you know anything about the Athenaeum Theater in Chicago, there's a there's a, a metal staircase on the side of the stage. So anyway, so I sat there. Um then when I finally got up, man, I could barely walk. I could barely walk. Like it took everything and it hurt so bad. Um, and I was taking really small steps. And I, again, I'm trying to pass it off as I'm just being cool. I'm not in a rush. I don't want nobody to know, you know. Um, and, and this was on a Saturday night. And I remember this so vividly because I just went home and I got into bed and, you know, Sometimes when you're growing up, you're taught to sleep things off. And so I was like, man, I hope whatever this is, when I wake up in the morning, I'll be good. I'll be good. And, you know, Sunday is a, is a, is a Mad Rhythms. It's our rehearsal day. That's church. So Mad Rhythms Church every Sunday. Um, and so I remember waking up and I couldn't move. So I'm laying in the bed. I'm looking at, I'm looking at, you know, the ceiling. And I'm like, man, I, man, it's tearing me up just to think about it. Uh, man. Oh. Sorry, right, bro. You can take a minute too, if you need, I have to tell you that the power of you being vulnerable and doing it publicly is beautiful. That's a, that's a role model in my book. <laughs> Although I, I tend to cry that. when I see other people cry, <laughs> so you better watch it. <laughs> that's crazy. I didn't even know that this would do that to me. Um, but I think it's because it took me right back to the moment of realizing the first thought wasn't, I might not be able to walk. The first thought was, I can't dance. And that, that was horrible. That was like the most horrible thought for a tap dancer, especially somebody who loves this art form. You know, bro, so, this is exactly why I wanted you to talk about this because I think people feel that and it is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's our first passion. It's the reason we wake up in the morning um, and, and to confront the fact that maybe that will not happen again is mm -hmm. terrifying. But look at you now. Right. <laughs> like, so clearly you came through it. And and I'll be honest, I've watched you dance for, what, 25 years. Mm -hmm. I feel like you definitely like most artists, the older you get the more mature, the more sophisticated, the more subtle. The, I mean, you're, you're dancing better than I think you've ever danced in your life. Um, Thanks, so I, think it's so I appreciate important. that. I mean it. That's a great. That's a great way to get me to stop crying. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, but I mean it very genuinely. Yeah, and I, and I just remember at that moment I called Jamani. Jamani mm -hmm. was the first person to know Jamani Taylor, um, and I was like, "Man, you got to run rehearsal today." Like even in the midst of my pain, I'm still trying to figure out. I was like, man, you got to run rehearsal today because I can't get out the bed. Yeah. And I think he might have laughed because, you know, being hungover could be a reason or, you know, there's a lots of reasons to not get out the bed. But yeah. I was like, nah, man, like in the show last night, something snapped in my back and I can't move. And then he, you know, he, he was silent for a moment. And he was like, man, I got it. Don't worry about it. And I remember like that process. Like, so I laid in the bed. I was a range of emotions, all of that stuff went through. And then um, I remember pretty much I spent an entire Sunday in the bed. And then so Monday I was like, okay, so I got, now I got to do something. I got to get to the doctor. Like, I like, this is not normal. This is not okay. Um, 
And I remember I went to the nearest Walgreens by my house and I bought a back brace like that workers wear. Yeah. And I put that back brace on and it automatically gave me a little bit of a relief. And then I went driving around and I was looking for a chiropractor. I had never gone to a chiropractor, but I immediately, like my mind, in my mind, I knew I did not want to go to the doctor and be told I had to have surgery. Like I, without even knowing what was fully wrong, I was like, man, I can't, nah. So I drove around Chicago um, looking for a chiropractor. And I remember this, this was right before, this was the week of Thanksgiving that year. And this was on, so Monday I'm driving around, I find a chiropractor that's open. This is my chiropractor to this very day. I find a chiropractor that's open and not only is he open, he can see me right away and he does, and he has a massage therapist on, on staff and he also does, and he does acupuncture. Wow. And this was Northwest Chiropractics in Chicago. I got to shout him out cause man, um, yeah. So I went in and that day, this was on a Monday after all this had went down Sunday, I spent two hours there. I, you know, I had to do the paperwork, do the intake form. Um, and he was also a chiropractor that did uh, x-rays. So that's not always a normal thing as well. So I lucked up or, or God, God put me in a position to find the one I needed that day. And after all that treatment, he said, man, so here's what, and he kind of explained, you know, technically, uh, yeah, whatever this, I forgot what it is, the L9 vertebrae, like th this thing is, it, it pushed out. Like that pop was it popped out of place. And, um, do it. yeah, and he's like, so what we're going to do, here's what you got to do. He was like, one, you're a tap dancer, which is hard on your back. Two, the way you tap dance, i.e. the style into the floor, it's extremely hard on your back. And he said, and then three, you got, you know, you're carrying some weight around. So you got to drop some of that because that's also hard on your back while you're dancing. So all of that, man, started me on this journey of, of health and wellness. And I was like, man, I got to lose weight. I got to, cause I wasn't going to not dance. Like there was no way. And as a matter of fact, the craziest part, and this is how we as dancers think I had a gig in Florida for like Florida dance masters or something that same week, that next weekend. And I was like, I got to do this gig. <laughs> and so, and he was like, no, I would recommend you not dance for at least a couple of weeks. And I was like, you know, I'm saying if I don't gig, I don't pay rent. Like it's as simple as that. So, so he, I said, so I just need you. So I went to him on Monday. I went back on Tuesday I went back on Wednesday. I went to the chiropractor three days in a row. And then he gave me some stuff that's like icy hot, but it's what chiropractor, um, what is it? Uh, oh, I have some right here. <laughs> bio oh, yeah, freeze. bio freeze. He gave me a thing, a bio freeze that was a roll on. And he said, he said, you're, you're very, you're back. If you keep it in one position for too long, it's going to lock up again immediately. He said, so if you're going to fly, you're going to have to tell them you got to get up every 30 minutes and walk when you, you know, anything that's whatever. So, you know, I, I went to the airport. I, <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever was like, I need to board in that first group. I need to, I need an aisle seat. I need to be able to walk up and down. I got, I got a back injury. So, and they accommodated me. Um, and I went to the gig and as soon as I got to the hotel, I was like, uh, I need ice. <laughs> I need, and I, and I nursed my way through that weekend of dance the very next weekend after my back had completely gone out and it wasn't, and it wasn't because I'm a super healer or I willed it to be. I just like that survival. Like when your passion and your survival connect, man, it's, 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 it, it'll make you, it'll give you superhuman abilities in some ways. And so, yeah, I, um, I did that gig and then I just kept, and then, you know, and that led me to trying to eat healthier, which led me to trying to cut certain things out of my diet, which led to veganism. Mm. And then, but like, I never set out to become a vegan. I was just trying to get healthy to keep my back healthy so I could keep dancing. Yeah. And it's worked. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
So first off, just thank you for sharing that. And again, thanks for being vulnerable. I think it's, uh, it's so important for young, you know, we have, a, we have young people to watch these interviews. And I think mm -hmm. for them to see adult men that they look up to, like be open to being vulnerable and expressing themselves emotionally, what a beautiful gift. So yeah. uh, that's mean, I try to model and I, I love that you modeled that um, just now. So thank you. That's beautiful. It wasn't on purpose, um, but but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear that. <laughs> but, but but you know what it is? It's just man walking in truth, walking in truth, and and not the older you get, the more you realize that there's expectations of you, and then there's who you are. And the older you get, I just think you stop you stop worrying about those expectations, yeah. and you just start worrying about who you are, who you want to be and what type of legacy you want to leave, create, and then leave. Yes. So tell me this. Uh, you know, in addition to lineage, I think one of the other things that, that influences so much as, as tap dancers is this concept of regionality. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see, because I, I have a few thoughts about this, but this isn't my interview. <laughs> I'm curious <laughs> if you think that there is a Chicago approach to tap or a Chicago style um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that and how has that shaped you? Well, the first thing is I never thought there was, I never even thought of it as a thing. And then I would go places, uh, and people would say, can you, can you, or I would like book a gig and people are like, can we call your class Chicago style? And at first I'd be, <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, I, I, there is no style. Like I don't. I just tap dance. Yep. And then kind of like as we progress through time, people would like see stars somewhere. I saw this, I saw this guy or I saw this girl and they were tapping and, and I asked them where they were from and they said Chicago. And I was like, yep, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. That's that Chicago style is the way. And so to this day, <laughs> I still don't quite know what the Chicago style is. I don't, I don't know. Um, um, may somebody, I real, can I interject yes. really quick? I think yes. it means there's no ketchup on it. Say it again. It means there's no ketchup on it. Mm. That's a hot dog joke. Chicago style hot dog. No. Oh Lord. Oh, I'm ketchup. making a hot dog joke with a vegan. Yeah, that's terrible. Right. <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> Sorry. That was a joke for all my, for all the Chicago people watching. Yeah. yeah. Chicago style. Every time I hear the word Chicago style, all I can think of Chicago style dog. Um, so <laughs> yeah, please, but, but I, you're right. I, I can get that joke <laughs> because the reality is I didn't know about the difference in what you put on a hot dog when I was a kid until I started traveling to other places. And they're like, what? Relish? Yeah. Hot peppers? Sport peppers? What? Right? So I, yeah, I, celery I salt? It. Yeah, man, we take it seriously here in Chicago. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Go ahead with what you were saying. I apologize. I but yeah, uh, it's been a long time, bro. So that joke, it's a, I had to go back to access those <laughs> memories for that joke. <laughs> so please continue. I'm sorry. It was such a serious thing we're talking about. Yeah, too. So Chicago style of tap dance. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Jimalita, no, you didn't with the pictures of the hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um. But no, but so I, to this day, I don't quite know, like someone tried to explain it to me as um, the way you, we sit in the rhythm. Mm. But I don't know what that is because I think all of us, our mission is to sit in the pocket. Like, yeah. you know, that's, I, so I, yeah, there is I, evidently a Chicago style, but I don't quite know how to define it. And I guess maybe because I'm from here, that is just innate to me. Yep. You know, one thing I, I feel like maybe we take very seriously here and that uh, is maybe something that uh, is becoming more common but wasn't necessarily common 20 years ago when I moved here. Um, but I know it's a shared passion of you and I. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you've probably never once taught a tap class where you didn't talk about tap history. Well, I wouldn't say never, not once, because probably early on I wasn't doing history in my classes, but it quickly found its way into my teaching. And so it probably wasn't long before. Um, I mean, at the least, I was always taught to give credit where credit was due. 
Yes. So in teaching warm ups that came from other people, I at the least always said, this is a Steve Condos rudiment. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, uh, this is the Idella Reed Davis warm up. Like this is, and I, I would tell people, look, if you if you're doing this somewhere and somebody says, oh, what's that called? Don't say the Brill Barrett warm up. Say this is the Steve Condos rudiment. And I learned it in Brill Barrett's class. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll take that credit that I taught it to you, but it's not mine. And but I think the more I learned about history, that's also the more I realized that even then those black men and women who were doing this thing in tap weren't given credit and that, that kind of, you know, that, that'll go into part of where the conversation leads, but credit, giving credit where credit is due has always important. And also just me as a black man, like, like everybody knows Thomas Edison. Not many people knew Louis Latimer. Everybody, you know, you know, so there's things like black people used to invent stuff all the time. And because of the times we were in, in this country, the inventions would just, just get stolen. It wasn't, I'll give you credit. Let's say we did it together. I would just take your patent and put my name on it. I, I remember reading, I don't remember whose story, but that the guy at the patent office took a black person's patent, called the white person they knew that was de dealing in the same industry and just gave it to him. So like the, the, the thievery is real and the thievery has been in existence since our existence on this continent. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that takes it to a wide berth, but to bring it back to tap. So even I always had a, a reverence for where things came from before I was a tap dancer. But then as I got into tap and as I started being taught history, I made it my duty to share that history as much of it as I could. And then as historic things happened to me, then I started to share those stories. Damn. So, but it's always been important. And it, and it, like, that's one of the things that saddens me is when people don't know. I don't get mad at people who don't know. I get mad at the teachers who didn't teach. Mm. Because if, if you don't know what you're supposed to know, you know what I mean? Then how do you, how do you deal with that? But as a teacher, so... I'm glad that like in, in, in the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to teach teachers or do teachers classes or workshops or whatever you want to call it. And I always share with them, like, it's your responsibility. If your students don't know that that's your fault. And so you got to now be willing to open your horizons up and, and get your study on so that you can then pass it. And then that is how an art form truly stays alive yes without a doubt yeah all right we're getting into the nitty-gritty now aren't we <laughs> so i love it no this is important so i'd like to point out that the recognition of the historic racial inequalities in america certainly we see this in tap dance right you can't talk mm -hmm. about tap dance and not talk about um america's sinful racist history yeah. so doing something about that that's built into the name of the organization that, that you helped found. Will you talk a little bit about, I don't know that everyone even knows that MAD is an acronym. Um, mm -hmm. so tell people a little bit about that because I think it's important. Okay. Well, yeah, I remember in some of the, the early conversations with Martin Trey Dumas III, um, mm. we were just talking about naming this thing that we were working with these young people. We decided to start a company um, and the funny thing is both he and I are fans of like nineties hip hop. So at one point, at one point in hip hop, it, you know, especially in New York, everything was mad cool, son. You know, I got mad flavor. I got mad, whatever. That's mad dope, son. Like mad was, it was a real strong word used in, in, in hip hop vernacular to, to add that oomph to, to, to the approval of something. And so, and then of course, the tap dancers being rhythmic and being about rhythm was, mm -hmm. was, is, is always front and center. Um, and so, yeah, we was just like, what if we call it mad rhythms? And then, you know, and then, and then I was like, and people outside of nineties hip hop, they're not going to get it. So maybe the, maybe the mad has to mean something. And so we just talked, we just, we, this was a conversation and we, and we were talking about what it would mean. Like, what's the purpose? We know we're a tap dance company, but what's our purpose? Like what, what's going to make us different than any other tap dance company that we know of? 
And I was like, well, you know, and in that conversation is where the talk about being able to stay connected to the to 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 the hood, to the to to the places like where we grew up and where we came from. Um, um, that was important. And and that was so important because especially for me, if if tap a tap dancer hadn't come to my neighborhood and been in my community center. I would not be a tap dancer today. Like I, I, I didn't know where to go get it. I didn't even know to go get it. Someone brought it to me and said, here, try this on. And I tried it on and I loved the fit. And it's been that way ever since. So Mad Rhythms, I felt like no matter what we did, we had to stay connected to community. We had to stay rooted in community. And so, you know, tossing around the word mad and breaking it up and, so that's where making a difference dancing rhythms was born out of that conversation. And the whole thing was about, you know, we're not just going to gig, we're not just going to perform, but we've got to use this art form to make a difference in the lives of young people. And, and, and especially young black people who grew up just like us and who, who, if, if we're not this dance, where would we be? So literally that's so mad. That's what mad rhythms means. Um, and it's so funny because I, I know a lot of people don't know that. I, I never forget one day Jay Sam's, uh, Jason Samuel Smith called me up and this was in the earlier day. This is around Imagine Tap Time, about 2006. And this is when people left voicemails. So, you know, some <laughs> people on this call might not know what a voice message is. <laughs> I remember. Um, I remember. <laughs> but... He left a voice message and he literally said, uh, I'm looking for a, a mad rhythm, a, 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 a upset syncopation, a, a angry beat. And he just started ripping off the different ways. And I cracked up and I laughed. But the next time I talked to him, I said, I, mad doesn't mean like we tap mad, like we're angry or upset. It's, it, you know, it, this is what it means. And I broke it down to him. But that was the funniest thing because I, I think in the beginning, people thought like, like oh oh they mad like here, here they come they they're mad the way they tap is ain't it's mad they they they, <laughs> tap, they hit the floor hard because they're mad you know and so yeah so that's far but I mean part of that was also true in a sense of 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 learning how to dance out your aggressions and your feelings and your emotions and sometimes when you're angry much better to hit the floor than to hit somebody so there was truth in that statement. It, as well. So that's why I think Mad Rhythms was such a good fit because it was an ode to to actually being able to dance out your aggression. It was an ode to 90s hip hop, which is what I grew up with. But then it was also what we wanted to be and who we wanted to be as a tap dance company. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the novice to professional pipeline and why that's so important? Yeah, well, so when you start dealing, and, and of course you hear a lot about this around any election time when there's about to be somebody's getting elected to something and they start talking about uh, the crime rates and the, and, and the prison population and all that. So there's many number, number of, of black scholars that I've listened to over the years have talked about the school to prison pipeline. Mm. And basically when, when, a, when, when a black youth is in fourth grade, depending on reading and math scores, they know how many prisons to build. Because depending on fourth grade reading and math scores, they can try to determine that this kid will end up in prison. And when I heard about that and started reading about it and, and hearing about it, and I was like, that's, that's bananas. So like at fourth grade, you're written off in society if you're black. And that's like, that's something probably nobody's talking about right now, but that's also part of the societal racism um, or systematic racism that exists. And if they're planning prisons based on the, the, the acumen of a fourth grader, as if there's nothing that happens between fourth grade and the rest of your life that could change your path. And that's crazy. So um, I never start out to start, a, I never set out to start a school. I I started a company and then the school grew out of the company because people were like, 
we want we want our kids to dance like those dancers mm-hmm. and 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 we started the school and it was funny even that was a community thing um uh, mama ife as we called it ife mcwater who used to run the chicago park district south shore culture center where we started we did our show and she was like now that you've done a show, people want to study with you. What are you going to do? And I was like, well, I guess we could start a school. <laughs> After a couple of years of school, she's like, well, now people are studying. People are hearing. Now people want to come study with you from other places. What are you going to do? And the Chicago Tap, so the Chicago Tap Summit was born out of that. So mentors, man, it's it's really, it's really important to have mentors in your life. And I've had many and various through different parts of my life. Um but I never set out to start a school. I didn't set out to be a tap teacher at all. I wanted to be a tap dancer. I wanted to get rich and famous tap dancing. And I would teach to hold down a job until the next performing gig came. And I know any tap dancer, any professional tap dancer here knows that story. I used to say, if I'm not famous by the time I'm 18, I'm going to quit. Then I was like, if I'm not a famous tap dancer by the time I'm 19, then I'm going to quit. This went on for about 10 years. And then I was like, okay, fame is not even what I'm going for anymore. So I realized that the teaching was something, even though I only did it in between performing, I really enjoyed it. I grew to enjoy it and I grew to love it. And then later on, I, I grew to think that teaching tap was more of my call than performing it which is, that's an interesting self-conversation to have. Um, but so, so Mad Rhythm Tap Academy started with a few classes. And then as we started to grow, we started doing our youth programs. And that was literally the way to really start working with the kids that weren't in TAP schools. Because TAP Academy was kids whose parents brought them to a TAP school. Right. They paid tuition. That was that. But then our youth programs and our youth job programs allowed us to start reaching and connecting with young people who didn't know anything about the arts or the art form of tap. And, and, and it's funny, I started our youth program at the same place that I started tap. So that was a full circle moment for me because when it was time to do it, I was like, I want to go right back to my neighborhood and start the same thing that enabled me to do what I do now. Um, and so that was like the 14 to 18 demographic is literally in our youth programs. Um, and so our school service, you know, from, from five, I, I always say from five to 105. <laughs> and then we start getting these kids who stayed with the youth program, but at 18, they aged out. Once they went away to college, they couldn't do the youth program anymore. So then we started the apprentice program for the professional company of Mad Rhythms. And that's way anybody who came out of the youth program could then apprentice with the professional company. And then one day I realized it wasn't my intent, but then one day I looked at all the things that we did and I said, man, a kid can come in here at five years old, not knowing what a tap shoe is and end up in a professional tap dance company without ever leaving this building. And so I was like, wow, that is literally the novice to professional. Like that is the, we have created our own pipeline to offset what happens when the government sees a fourth grader doing bad or a kid, whatever. So that's what that is. But like that, it's important because you, you can't take a bunch of kids from an underserved community, give them all this knowledge and then turn them loose and say, sorry, you're 18, you're too, you're now too old to do the program. Have fun. Because a lot of them will go back to the things that they knew or familiar with, or that they think are available to them. But now when we do our youth programs, kids know, or young people know that I could, if I want to keep going with this, I could become a professional. And so it's very cool now to have professional members in the company who at one time were TAP Academy students or were our, our youth program attendees. And now they're in our professional company. So it's just, it's, it's mind blowing, man, but it, it yeah. it's what needed to happen. It's what we needed to have. Mm. So Brill, we're going to take a 30 second break because Instagram okay. live, but it's an hour limit on uh, conversation. So we're just going to oh, log wow. off. 
Okay. And then we're going to log right back in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I didn't realize the hour passed. I told you I love to talk. Oh, you and me both. And I love listening to you talk. Yeah, thank you so much for everything you're sharing. So everybody, please problem. join us. We'll be back. Cool. I'll see you literally in like... 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. Founder and Artistic Director, Chicago Tap. We are back for the second half of our interview with Chicago tap dancer and, <clears throat> pardon me, and artistic director of Mad Rhythms, Brill Barrett. I hope you guys have been enjoying this conversation so far. I think it's been uh, really amazing. A lot, of, a lot of things we've talked about I think are super important right now. I really loved um, his point of view on education, I thought was particularly interesting. And he, I see him. So here we go. We are going back live with Mr. Brawl Barrett. Here he comes. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back. I'm surprised people are tuning back in, man. I can't believe people just went <laughs> to an hour of, oh, God, and they want more. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's pretty engaging. I, I really think, you know, the reason I started this partially was mm -hmm. I felt like... Um, one of the few silver linings of this pandemic was all of a sudden people had time to sit and watch mm, and to mm. listen, right? And mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of people that always wanted to engage more with uh, the people they look up to and that they respect. Um, and they wanted that opportunity to really hear what they thought, but didn't necessarily mm -hmm. know how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing, you know, the, the 10 questions I do at the end that are just kind of fast and, and maybe a little superficial. Um, mm -hmm. I really thought about, you know, if, how much I wish the tap dancers that, you know, we look up to and revere from 50 years ago or a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. I would love to have a video of them talking about all the things we're talking about, but also like the simple things, like what kind of tap shoes they like to wear, <laughs> right? Did they like their taps tight or loose? Like these kind of things that don't necessarily mm -hmm. seem that important. On the other hand, for like nerds like us, right? Who like live, mm -hmm. eat, breathe, tap and tap history. That stuff is like, cool right yeah, so yeah, i really yeah, think yeah. you know 50 years from now people are going to be looking back at this um <laughs> and this is something that they're going to be uh really happy that is there i think getting to hear not the fact that we created on our end but the fact that they get to hear from all the people we've been interviewing because we yeah. we've been remarkably lucky uh that every person we've asked to do this so far except one mm. has said yes and I'm, I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get that one. One of these. I'm, I'm never gonna get him. Uh, it's a good friend. The funny thing is, the the one I want to interview that said no is not like some inaccessible person that I've never met. It's a dear uh -huh. friend who's just like, no, I don't do podcasts. And I'm gonna tell you something. <laughs> you and I both know this person, uh, um, and he's uh, one of my favorite humans, not just in tap but on earth. Uh, um, uh. So I'm just gonna leave that right there, and I'll see if you can figure <laughs> out who I might be talking about. <laughs> a highly spiritual member of our tap community mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but yeah he was like he was like no nah, I don't do <laughs> like, all right <laughs> I can't argue with that <laughs> so yeah. um moving on all right, um, all right. so I'll, I'll tell you you know there's some questions that I really debated I was like do I really want to bring this up do do I have the right to bring this up as like me as a white tap dancer within this black art form? Is this a discussion that I really want to initiate or be a part of? Mm -hmm. um, because it feels, uh, uh, it makes me feel very vulnerable, right? I, I find mm -hmm. that I'm scared that I'm going to use the wrong language or that I haven't quite understood yet how to say the things that I believe in a way that are clear and that don't mm -hmm. leave room for confusion. Um, mm -hmm. And then I kind of shoved all that aside and was like, get over yourself, you fragile white person, um, <laughs> and talk about what matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, that's, that's real talk. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, I, one of the controversies that we've had, and I don't think for many of us it is a controversy, but I know mm -hmm. that for some people it is, is this notion of twin parentage, right? This idea... Uh -huh that tap dance arose out of the intersection of Irish culture and West African culture. Um, and I will tell you that, that I have changed my language in the past few years teaching about this. Um, mm -hmm. 
I think when I was coming up in the tap world, you know, the way it was taught to me, it's almost, it's almost like uh, this, this vision of like beautiful democracy of like black and white people coming together, despite how difficult the times were and the prejudice and together they created this beautiful art form. And I've, I've come <laughs> to shift it and how mm -hmm. I describe it um, by saying that to me, I think uh, certainly I, you, you look at tap dance and mm -hmm. you can see many similarities between what we do and what Irish dancers do, right? You, mm -hmm. you can see specific steps we do and all that. But to me, there is no argument whatsoever that at its core, it is an African-American art form. And that if you took the West African element out of tap, you, you would have Irish dance. It, wouldn't, it would no longer be what we call tap dance. So if, if mm -hmm. you're going to talk about tap dance, you, there's no way, shape or form that you cannot say that it's an African-American art form and that it's mm -hmm. rooted in black culture and black history. Um, and I think it's interesting because I, I think you know that I'm a jazz nerd almost as much as I am a tap nerd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, in jazz music, they don't really have this controversy. They don't have this, this uh, drama that we have. Everyone gets like, yeah, are some of the instruments that jazz musicians are playing, are they traditionally European instruments? Certainly. Yeah. Were there uh -huh. white musicians in, in the beginning of, of jazz music? Certainly. Mm -hmm. Would you would you ever say that jazz music is not a black art form? No, exactly. no, no. So, Brill, <laughs> talk about this. <laughs> well, lay some knowledge on all of us, because I so know that say, I know that you uh, got some things to say. Yeah. Well, let's start off with this. Everywhere you go in the world, jazz is called jazz, mm. and you're right. The origins are not argued, debated. It's not a controversy. There are plenty of white people in jazz, but nobody is trying to say that they created jazz. And so I love that about jazz and how it's received all over the world. Now, let's go to tap. Tap is called something different in every country. Why? Because in the country where it was created, all of this debate and, and all of that stuff has created, there was uncertainty. So, you know, you go to Italy, it's called tip tap. You, you go to, you know, I don't have to tell you, you go to France, it's called. Yeah. Claquette. Mark? Oui, <laughs> claquette. Claquette. Yep. Yeah. If you, you go to, you go yep. to some uh, Spanish speaking places and there's Zapateado, like there's all these different names uh, in German is step, step tons. Like there's all these different names and it's because it's never been respected properly in the place it was created. So the rest of the world just took it and did what they did with it because they were like, well, it, it is what it is, whatever. So that's part of the same thing I love in seeing the way jazz is represented. It's part of the thing I know that's a big problem in the way tap is represented. Um, and that's before you even get into the next phase. So the next phase Influence versus origination. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, origination, uh, but I'm using it today. So I love it. Use it. Things, things can have influence. And everything we do, like if you look at hip hop now versus hip hop from 10 years ago, and I mean the dance form. Yeah. It's not the same. But, and and now there there's all kind of house dancing, whacking, tutting, but it's still considered hip hop and it's still the same art form. So it's so interesting to me that tap is that one thing, um, that one thing that, that, that has become this debate. Now here's the interesting thing. I was taught the same history you were taught. So I grew up also thinking that tap was one part Irish, one part African to make a whole of tap. One parent was this, one parent was that, and you got this. Because that's the history that people were putting in books. Books by which of none were written by black people. So that, that's a whole nother conversation. The historians and the keepers of the stories are for the most part not black. So that's that. So then you reach to the next part. Um, I had the beautiful opportunity to go to Ireland. And the first question I started asking in the Irish competitive dance world was, what's, what story do you all tell here about the creation of TAP in America? 
And I got a resounding, we have nothing to do with that. From all the <laughs> Irish people I talked to in Ireland. And I said, okay. So then I thought about, I was in Riverdance. Now, Riverdance was a wonderful experience for me. But people who have not seen the show might not know that Riverdance hired tap dancers and they specifically hired black tap dancers because Riverdance itself was telling a story and the story they were telling the whole first half of the show. This is how I could sprain my ankle in the back rehearsing, because for the whole first half of the show, the show was about Irish history in Ireland, what, what they went through, the famine, the plague, the, the, all the things that happened in Ireland. So for the whole first half of the show, the tap dancers were always in the studio working out. Second half of the show opens with the journey to a new world. It literally, the narration starts with the journey to the new world. And the first people they meet are black tap dancers, not black dancers who we then got together with and created tap with black tap dancers, i.e. they were already tap dancing when we got here. And again, this is the story told from the Irish perspective. So in Ireland, they don't claim tap. In the show that is world renowned for telling the Irish story and dance and music, they don't claim tap. Yeah. So then I start thinking, so where does this, where is this coming from? What is this origin story that we've been taught if it doesn't come from the people who created the form that we're saying is one half of this form. And that's when I thought good old American racism, good old institutionalized racism, good old systematic racism. At the time when Irish and black folks were connecting, there was no, Hey, what's up? Let's, let's get, let's hang out. Let's get a beer. We were living in a society that was treating black people as less than human and treating Irish people as the lowest denominators of human. But at least they were still being treated as human. Yeah. And so I always tell people like, like the story doesn't make sense. Where else in our history is there a story that talks about two cultures, black and white coming together and creating something that we now know as this that lived harmoniously and creatively together to create this thing. That's a made up story. It, it didn't happen. Now, I heard Robert Reed, Professor Robert L. Reed, I always try to make sure I'm properly notating who I'm talking about, rest in peace. He talked about one time, he said, man, you gotta realize it, we were surviving then just like we're surviving now. In those times, if a black dancer was busking, or street performing in an Irish pub or even on the street and some Irish people walk past, oh yeah, he'll start doing a jig because he's trying to get them to drop that coin. And so the thing that existed and the other thing that existed, there are influences that, you know, that, that ended up being connected into tap. The first, one of the first steps I learned after toe hill, dig slap, shuffle flap, a front Irish. The step was literally called a front Irish. Then we learned the back Irish. So I've never argued that there's influence of the Irish culture in tap. That has never been my statement. But what I say is, how did it become part of the origin story? If everybody's stories from that part of the world says, when we got here, they were doing that. And then that's not to go into the cakewalk and the ring shouts like there's African-American history and heritage that people are acting like didn't exist. Yeah. You know, um, think about this in the day in the days of Master Juba's life. Black people were not treated as anything special. Yeah. So then why do we call him the first tap dancer? Why are we giving credit for something that he does not deserve in a society where we, we don't get credit for stuff that we've done and that we do deserve? So why are we giving, you got to think about that. Every, no, I've not heard anybody argue. Now that's one thing I haven't heard anybody argue that Master Juba was the first tap dancer or the, I, I say the first known tap dancer, but why that's was he even Juba. known? Yeah. Why was he even known? Because a white guy, AKA Charles Dickens, wrote about him. 
Mm-hmm. I was at the World's Fair and I saw this guy doing this. He was the first person I'd ever seen doing this. What's this? Tap dance. But just to show you how facts can be, this is the thing about storytelling. If you're really good at it, you can weave a lie into the truth and nobody mm-hmm. will know the difference. Um, the book, What the Eye Hears, a lot of people did not like it from the get. Before I ever got a copy, I almost didn't open it because I was almost preconditioned to listen to what the community was saying. Mm-hmm. That book is BS. I'm, I'm going to try to watch my language because I know we have young people that connect Thank with you us. Thank you, that, that. That book was, was, was some ish. And so um, a friend gave it to me as a gift, as a birthday gift, gave me the book. So I did not go spend money on it, and I'm glad. Um, But what I noticed, so I opened the book up, and it's funny. I didn't start reading it from the beginning. One day I just, I was sitting there looking at it, and I just opened it up. And it literally opened up to the page that described the interaction between John Diamond and Master Juba, the battles that they had in the early days of TAP. Now, I knew about this. I'd researched and read about this. And this is also where that's a big example of the TAP versus the Irish. They were not doing the same thing. They were doing something that people saw similarities in, which we can all see similarities, like you stated early on. And they were battling all around the world. Like these exhibitions became like the thing. But in the book, What the Eye Hears is the first time I've ever heard, or sorry, not heard, seen John Diamond referred to as a hoofer. And I was like, wait a minute, go check your resources, people. In the book, What the Eye Hears, it says the the hoofer, Master Juba, Juba, had was in constant dance contest or had a dance battle with the hoofer John Diamond. And I said, see, that's where the shit starts. I'm sorry. I, dang, I said I was gonna watch my language. That's where the <laughs> ish started. That's where the ish starts. So now here we are, decades later, generations later, here's this new book. Now everybody's reading it. Now everybody's telling their tap students to read it. Now in their mind, John Diamond was a hoofer. So now the origin of tap being Irish and, and, and African makes more sense because you've now called Don, John Diamond a hoofer. Mm. But he wasn't. He was an Irish step dancer. He danced a jig. I was in river dance. Although there's similarities, there's also a lot of differences. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we love the triplet. That's one thing I always <laughs> say when I watch Irish dance, I'm like, oh, please, somebody do a triplet. Somebody give me a dot, dot, dot. Leave my kingdom for a triplet. But that's the West African, right? That's, yeah, without um, that West African influence, that triplet is so important. Yeah, yeah. You but also, it. somebody explained it to me like this. I can love sports, and I can love basketball, and I can love football. But just because they're both sports played with a ball doesn't make them the same. Yes. And that's like the simplest way. I was like, man, I never thought about that analogy. Hmm. Um, and if you want to try it, if you think it, be a tap dancer, put on some Irish step shoes, some hard shoes, and go try to be an Irish step dancer. It, <laughs> your life will be ruined because it's a whole different technique, a whole different approach, a whole different thing. And I can say that because I was in river dance. I was, and before river dance, I worked in Chicago with the Trinity Irish dancers. Before river dance existed, I did a piece um, with Trinity called Turf. And it was literally. Mark Howard was like, I want to do something where we have tap battle Irish. And this was way before River Dance. So I've been I've been interspersed with the Irish dance community. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I think somehow I was supposed to, and I'll tell this story real quick. When I was in River Dance, the first day of rehearsal, we had to sign in on a call board. Everybody's name was listed. You found your name. You checked it off saying you were there for rehearsal. My name is Brill Barrett. Oh, yeah, Turf with Tim O'Hara. Yep, yep, yep. I'm sorry, I'm answering the question. Um, And I checked in, and I went, and it's, it's listed in alphabetical order, last name first. So I went, Barrett. Oh, there it is. Barrett, 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 Barrett. There's about 40 Barretts in Riverdance. And I went home to my mom. I was like, did you know our last name was Irish? 
<laughs> and she was like, no, I didn't know that. So even doing my own research into my own family history, I was like, so either we were somebody intermarried, that's the pretty story that I would hope could be right, or because some Irish folks eventually did own slaves, perhaps our ancestors were owned by Irish slave owners. And that's the story you don't hear much of. Because when people think about the Irish community and what they went to, went through, and when they came here, people probably would never imagine that they would turn around and then own people. But that's that, but that's when you did when you realize that the system of white supremacy in this country is a whole different thing. And it creates a different mindset. Um, so, yeah. So historically speaking, none of the stories match up when you start applying them to actual other things that happened in history all around the same time. So, I mean, are we influenced? Can we be? Do we share influences? That's always been a thing. <coughs> Excuse me. That's always been a thing. But my problem is... You don't have to say you created something to be a willing participant in it. There's a video, there's a video going around right now of a little girl, a little black girl doing Irish step dance to the Savage song and everybody shared it. But I guarantee you that little black girl does not walk into her Irish dance class and say, you know, my ancestors had something to do because it's just not true. But that doesn't mean she's not a really good Irish step dancer. You know what I mean? So like, and that's the problem. That's where, to me, white supremacy and systematic racism comes in because it says we need to claim credit so that we can have ownership, so that we can then later exploit. And that leads us into a lot of the situations we see now. Um, I've heard, so this is the story I've heard, and I've heard the story devolve, and not evolve, but devolve into where the Irish entered the story. So as, this, as the history about the Irish community and the African or the newly freed African-Americans in Chicago, as that story got debunked and people start applying facts, realizing that that's not true, got, instead of admitting that, a certain somebody, who we'll talk about later, started telling the story differently. And that some certain somebody started telling the story as, well, the slave ships had Irish deckhands on them. And when they brought the slaves up to exercise them, they taught them all a jig. And that's how the Africans came here, knowing how to do Irish dance. And I'm like, really? So instead of admit that what you think is the truth is not the truth, you're now going to add a new lie that places the Irish indentation into tap dance further back because you can't say it happened in Africa because nobody's yeah. going to believe yeah. that. But the transatlantic slave journey, possibly on the ship on the way, well, that might be something that you can claim. Hmm. And that's literally how I heard Lane Alexander tell the story of tap. And I'm like, that's crazy. That is crazy. And it is so not true, but you are now. And then the funny thing is people will call me. I was at this thing, this tap thing, and this guy was on stage talking about that Africans learned Irish on the slave ships and, and came here with tap dance already with the Irish mixed in. And I'm like, did that even make sense to anybody? No. But the fact that you have to craft a story that still somehow makes you part of the origination, the origination, the original that just shows the, 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 the lengths which you are willing to go to prove white supremacy, to prove I created this. I have ownership because I created it. And that's what we've been fighting. And it's sad that we have to fight it, but part of it is because, think about it, why is TAP's history so blurred? Because if you don't consider people important, i.e. black people at that time, three-fifths of a man, chattel, property, then why would you consider anything they created important, especially important enough to write down? We know ballet history because ballet has already been notated, always been notated. From the beginning, it was considered the, the entertainment of royalty. So therefore, must be notated, must be kept alive exactly. A plie is a plie no matter where you go. 
but a toe is a tip, a step, a ball, because tap's history was not notated. As a matter of fact, the early tap dancers, we know this, when we talk about the hoofers, they were making it up. So how can we say the hoofers were making it up as they were going along back in Harlem and also say that the Irish people, the stories don't make sense. But if you had any opportunity to talk to or watch any of the documents, uh, uh, documents, any of the documentaries, no maps, about tap, like any of those documentaries about tap, and you hear them say, we were making it up as we were going. We were out on the streets. We were doing this. So now how were they making up something that the Irish people created before them? It mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. And we know this because the steps didn't have names, and they didn't teach you, you, you learned from stealing what the next man did. And even then, when you stole it, you had to change it or you got, you was, you was not good. It was not a good thing. So you had to steal and be creative in your stealing to get new steps for your repertoire that other dancers have figured out on their own. You figured out your stuff on your own. We come together, we trade, we cipher, we cut. That's tap dance history. So... That's why all the steps are now different names, different this, different that, because the original tap dancers didn't create the framework in terms of the names of stuff. So if that theory makes sense to you, then the other theory can't make sense to you. Like the two theories clash. And so that's where it is. I'm just, I'll be glad to get to the day when I don't have to talk about it this way, when I don't have to explain it, because we all now know, okay, that's the history. And now let's go tap. But right now, it's a strong education and re-education process because so many people, um, I'm going to walk while I move because my phone, I'm, I got to plug my phone in. Um, so many people have retold and changed that story that it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's just not a good thing. So we're going to keep doing what we do. And again, now, so that's the thing, the, the, the climate that we're in in this country right now, it's where we've been with tap all the time. Like this is this is not this is not new. And the only thing is, all we most black people have just, especially in the tap dance world, we just want credit. Like we already don't get credit for a lot of things. Why do people keep trying to take credit for the things we created instead of just enjoying them like they were meant to be enjoyed? And if you want to do the good thing the real thing, share the history, pass it down so that your students know about the sacrifices that those people who were treated less than. Mm -hmm. like, like you can't talk about Sammy Davis Jr. without talking about the Rat Pack. That's right. But you also got to talk about the fact that he had to stay at a different hotel and he had to go enter through a different, or the Cotton Club, all black people on stage, none of them could come in the front door and sit in the audience and watch the show. So like, this, like, to understand all that history of oppression and, and segregation and all that history of discrimination, you have to be real about where it came from. It came from us, which is why it's never been fully respected. It's why to this day, we're trying, we're fighting in the tap world. And meanwhile, the rest of the dance world is walking around saying that's not even a real art form. Oh, tap. I, I thought you said you were a dancer. That's why we started saying tap dancer. Right. Oh, 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 you're, oh, you're, you're a tap dancer. Well, I thought you said you were a dancer. Yes, tap is dance. Yeah. That, and that, you know, that, the whole term tapper, that's why I detest it. You know, I know some people are like, don't get hung up on labels, but when I think about what my ancestors went through to make this dance possible for me and for you and for everybody who now wants to, to, to be a practitioner or become a practitioner, we owe them the respect. Of, of certain things like when people call themselves I, i'm a you know I, i'm a jazz tap dancer or a classical tap classic tap was the one that got me like i only do the classical style i only do the classical style of tap and i'm like so you dance like john bubbles so you dance like baby lawrence yep, yep oh no no right. i mean i mean broadway well broadway is not classical broadway is a watered down that's 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 a whole nother conversation that's chapters later so if you say you're a classic tap dancer and you dance like the classically trained, well, there was no classically training, but <laughs> I mean, it was, but it was just a different class. You know, you know what I mean? So like all of that is, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's frustrating. I think 
just to be in a spot where you're trying to make people recognize the contributions to, to your ancestors, to the art form that they love. Like, why do I have to, you, if you love this art form, you should know the history of it. But I know it's hard for you to know the history because the people before you have made it so that that history is been whitewashed, has been changed, has been rewritten in some cases. And so, yeah, so that, I don't, I, I know I went off, this is probably another hour on that one tangent. Um, That's all right. Um, but it's important. So, it's, it's, it's important. So, bro, tell me this, because I feel like if I could get into the heads of a lot of people watching this interview, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that right now they are asking themselves, where, what kind of resources are out there where I can get a more accurate picture of our history? Because I think, I think generally speaking, most people want to get it right. I think most mm -hmm. people want to have a clear understanding and they want to make sure that they're passing on good information. Mm -hmm. um, are there resources that are available out there for people that you think are well-researched or vetted? Um, or is it just kind of what you and I are doing, having conversations, talking to each other? Well, there are resources. Um, of course, yeah, these conversations. Um, talk to Aunt Diane. Talk to Diane Walker. You'll get, you'll get, Aunt Diane is a walking history book. Um, I think uh, Hank Smith. I think a lot of people don't talk to Hank Smith, and Hank Smith is a dedicated historian. So every time I've been around him, I've learned a lot. Um, but in terms of books, like written materials, try to get materials that were written by the artists themselves. You know, like if you want to know about the Nicholas Brothers, they wrote a book. Get their book. If you want to know, like, and I think that's like in the in the history resources that are out there, there's a lot of good information in. Yeah. But you just have to be aware that be, from the viewpoint that a lot of it's told, the misconception starts in the beginning. And that's like, think about it. If my perception of you is wrong from the very beginning, everything you do is going to have a different slant to it because my miss, because I made, you know, I dealt with it that way. So I think, but again, like, uh, um, no maps on my taps <laughs> about tap, like those, every, every tap dancer <laughs> should have seen, or at some point see those two documentaries. Um, yep. um, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's a lot. My mind starts going through everything and trying to put it all into perspective, but try yeah. to get written materials written by the artists themselves. Yeah. Um, because then, like, and, and the reason I say that, so there's a book written by Rusty Frank that everybody knows about tap dance. I remember being on a, well, not being on a panel. I was moderating a panel. We had brought to Chicago, Dr. Jenny Lagon, Dr. Prince Spencer, Dr. Harold Cromer. And as a matter of fact, this was the TAP Summit, the last one before you didn't see the TAP Summit for a while because yeah. it was expensive <laughs> and it bankrupted us as an organization to bring all of these doctors in at the same time. Yeah. But in all honesty, I wouldn't trade it for the world because the knowledge that was shared. But I remember Cromer, Dr. Cromer, opening that book. Somebody in the audience, it was a panel discussion, and one of the kids in the audience asked him to sign that book. And he flipped through it, and he got to the part, the part in the book about him and his partner at the time. And he got silent, he read it, and then he threw the book across the room. And he said, that is not true. And I went, he's still alive. How did you not check with the source while you were writing the book and he's still here? And so that made me start looking at all the historical books with a side eye, like if you're not referencing the people in the book with their stories to them still being here, then you're not really doing your research. You're just telling the story you want to tell in the way you want to tell it. And I saw that and I was like, yeah, see, there's the problem. Here's the history book filled with stories of all these great people. And one of the people is in the room 
looking at huh. the book telling, and I, I, I think <laughs> I, I debated a long time whether I was going to, because this is all filmed. I debated a long time whether I was going to release that footage. But he went on a tangent. He went off huh. about not being mentioned in, or, or about his story being told wrong. That's so interesting. You know, that book, as I'm sure you know, that book, each chapter is an interview with a different tap dancer from the mm -hmm. 20s through the 50s. So I'm wondering uh, what, you know, who had said what they said. I, like, I'm really, I would love to get more about that. Yeah. that, that sounds like some well, meaty, chewy stuff. Well, um, you can talk to Aunt Diane about this when you interview her, because you definitely yeah. should. But she'll also I am tell you. Hey. Brill, if you want to put a little, you know, you know that, you know that she calls me herself my godmother, yeah, and that yeah. like I've known her since I was fourteen. Uh -huh. Have I been able to get her to agree to be on this show yet? No. Not yet. Well, a little well, whisper I, I, in I, her I, ear, maybe I'll from some it, mutual I'll, I'll friends. A, I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> but no, what I was just going to say you know, was, she can tell you, the, she can tell you the story about the chapter yeah. about Steve Condos. Mm. Oh, uh, I bet I know about it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, and, no, wait. And, uh, I know one side of it. No, I, you're right. I know one side of it. I'd love to hear. Well, she can tell you why. Yeah, why that was a problem, because yeah. she was trying to include that information against the wishes of, or or without really consulting or or dealing with, um, you know, the Steve Condos estate. And I was like, so once again, you've got the opportunity to include this information, but you're not dealing with the people connected to the person you're like. And that is in a nutshell, like a lot, you know, and those were interviews. So if you can't get the interviews right, what's the difference when it's just somebody sitting up researching and writing of their own accord? Mm. So tell me this. So, I want to because... Yeah. No, you. I mean, I want to be careful because I do want to keep it under two hours. And mm -hmm. we do have a couple of very important things to talk about. One okay. that is very specific and of the moment and that we have to talk about, because I know a lot yes. of people are very curious to get the story kind of more direct from the source. Um, but also, I just kind of a general note, because I think this is an important question. What do you personally see the role and responsibility of the tap artist to further tear down systemic racism and historic inequality? And, and this is, you know, something that I think is important to me, how is Don't Roll different for white tap dancers? Because I will tell you that I think my role is different. And I mm -hmm. think I have a different obligation as a white tap dancer. I think I have a greater responsibility to do the homework, to know the history, to talk to people, mm -hmm. um, to shut down ignorance from fellow white people. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, I, but I wanted to get your take on that. What, what do you see? But, what what but, role can we play, right? Because tap yeah. dancers, what can we do? Yeah, well, I think I think as a culture, because I mean, there's infighting in the family, and and I don't think that that there will ever not be. You know, that that's just I, you know, that's kind of with everything in every industry. But I think as a culture, even we have to. And that's the start. We have to agree on certain things. Like there's a lot we don't have to agree on, but there has to be one, two, three, maybe five things that we as a community, no matter who we are, all agree on. And I think that first thing has to be history. And that is probably, has been the most divisive and the most, i.e. controversial aspects of tap. But I think, and then of course, yes, you as a white tap dancer in particular is, is knowing that history. And like you said, being able to debunk the myths, being able to say, no, we, we've, we've already dismantled that theory. So let's not continue on that. Like understanding history allows you to see why things are the way they are now. Like if you want to know why we're in the situation we're in, you've got to see the situations we've gone through. Mm -hmm. White people have always thought black people were funny. And I don't mean that in a ha ha laugh. I'll pay to see you do comedy way, but they're different from us. So that that that's comedy. Like it's it's cool to laugh at you. So you got if you go back to if you go back to um the 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 vaudeville stuff, and you go back to like all these things started off as white people making fun of black people. Like blackface was a thing, and blackface became a thing that made so much money that 
that the white people say we can get black people to do blackface and still make more money because the audience just has to think that it's a white person pretending to be a black person. Yeah. But also black actors was like, man, all we got to do is put on this thing and make them think we white being pretending to be black and we can also get paid. And so like that whole, and that whole premise all the way around is screwed up, but it starts off with white people disrespecting and making fun of black people and then making careers out of it and then making money out of it and then creating industry out of it. So vaudeville to Broadway. It's, it's the same premise that made it what it is. And so when you know that history, then when you see certain things repeating themselves, you can say, stop. Not further segment and, and stick in with the divisiveness because what from what I know, everybody who's considered a rhythm tap dancer, and I do air quotes because I don't like the term. I think if you tap dance, you should be able to make rhythm, period. Um, but anybody who's a quote unquote rhythm tap dancer, I also, you could go to Broadway and do all of that choreography, but all of the choreography and some of the most iconic Broadway shows, if you bring it back to, to, if you, if you bring that choreography to rhythm tap dancers, we could do it. But if you take a lot of Broadway trained tap dancers and give them a Sarah Rice routine, they gonna trip all over their feet. And so, and then it becomes, are they two equal things and this is just one genre and that's just one genre? Or is it a thing that became, when we did it, we simplified it to make it so everybody could do it. And, uh, and then we'll call it this thing and we'll treat it this way and we'll make this be the thing so that now what you do seems like that's the outskirt, that's the, um, the, the out, outlying edge of this art form. So I think that edu education is the key, man. Like education is the biggest key. And, and, and what our white brothers and sisters in the tap dance community can do, much like you're doing, is combat the ignorance, is tell the stories. Like everywhere I go, even when they don't know tap or even when they don't know history, somebody might mutter Shirley Temple, somebody might say Fred Astaire and Jane Kelly. And that's because Hollywood, movies, that, that's why they're so famous. Does it mean they weren't good? No. But does it mean they were the best? No. Right. But it means they, they were in a time when that's what Hollywood was going to cast. Yeah. You know, you got to know about Bojangles fighting to be portrayed as something other than a service worker in his movies. The Nicholas Brothers, like all their early stuff, they're all service workers. So Hollywood emulated what was going on in real life because Hollywood said we can't sell movies if black people look this way, which is why the dance scenes in the early, the, that's how we got footage. Let's be very real about where footage comes from. We got footage because Hollywood would take the dance scenes out of the movies with the black dancers when they showed the movies in the Southern States, because they knew white people didn't want to see black people on their screens at all. And so that footage lived on its own. That's why in all the movies, the footage is a throwaway scene for the for the storyline or the plot of the movie. Yep, that's in right. In all of the footage, the actors can be doing all kind of stuff, and then they'll go to a restaurant and eat. That's you right. can take a meal out of a movie, and it doesn't change the storyline or the plot. Hell, that's even, right. Well, uh, even Francis Ford Coppola got on just recently talking about that he bowed to pressure of in the movie Cotton Club not focusing as much on Gregory Hines's character's storyline because people told him people don't want to see a lot of him. They don't want to see his life. They want to see those mobsters' lives. They want to see those white people's lives. Don't further develop the black guy's storyline. It's not that important to the movie. And that's not old. That's not old black and white Hollywood. That's not pre-sound Hollywood. That's the 80s. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when you look at all of that, there, has, there, seems, to, there seems to be a conscious effort to keep the story changed, to keep our contributions to the art form minimized. Yeah. And so all of our white brothers and sisters in the tap world, stop letting that happen. Do not let it happen on your watch. Tell people what's going on. Tell people what the stories are. And yeah, you got to talk about this stuff with little kids. I mean, obviously the approach is different, but don't try to make it sound so sweet. Like you teach them about Shirley Temple, you better teach them about Bojangles. Yeah. 
And you better be honest about what that was so they don't just growing up thinking, oh, they were partners and they got treated equally and they were in the movie and da 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 like that. You got to know. Like, and these things are important. So I, I implore you, tell the stories, and but you got to learn them first. And you got to talk to people. Unfortunately, many of them are no longer with us. You know, so I had, I was fortunate and blessed enough to meet a lot of the, the the masters before they moved on. And so I try to keep their stories alive in every class I teach. If you don't know their stories, get the people who they directly impacted, get the stories from them, pass the stories down. Yeah. And I think that makes us as a community all better, all better. Yeah. You can't, you can't think you created something if you haven't watched the footage of somebody doing it 50 years before you were born. Right on. Yeah. So, Brill, we, we, we've got to talk about the the of the moment thing. Mm -hmm. um, so after the protests began, after the, the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. um, the AD of the Chicago Human Rhythm Project reached out to you and other dancers from your company mm -hmm. and accused you of supporting, quote unquote, violence. You yeah. responded very, I have to say, tactfully, I thought, <laughs> um, and gracefully, um, by publicly calling him out for his behavior, as well as a history of exclusionary tactics, bullying tactics, um, that have been employed against the Chicago Tap community literally since, I think, the inception of the festival. Mm -hmm. uh, that response was in the form of a letter signed. The last time I looked, there were over 600 signatures. I don't know if you have an um, update. Yeah, we're at 763 signatures right now. Amazing. Um, what would you like to see happen next? Now that now that we have made our displeasure known and that the community has agreed with you that this is not mm -hmm. an okay thing to happen, what's next? Well, I, I, so this question has been asked to me quite a bit in the last few days. Now that we've made our grievances heard, can imagine. what's next? And you know that, and, and I'll be very honest in saying it wasn't the... When I, when I started that process, I hadn't thought that deep into it. I was just so disgusted is a good word. I was just so disgusted by that call out, by that accusation that I wanted it to be known that this is what I was saying. This is what it was about. And now let's talk about you and how you responded. And I wanted, I wanted to put that out there. I wanted to air it. I wanted to open it up. I had no idea of the stories and the sheer number of stories. Like, I had no idea we would get more than 100 signatures, in all honesty. I would have thought 100 signatures was saying a lot. But to be looking at closer to 1,000 signatures, and then the stories, man, the stories poured in. If you look at um, Star Dixon's post about the same situation and you look at the people that not only agree, but started sharing their stories. It, it is, it is ridiculous that someone could be that influential, but be that cruel to people for 30 years and it'd be allowed to go on, but that's the power dynamic. It'd be allowed to go on because that person or that entity is well funded and that funding which all of us as working dancers, a paid gig is the dream. Yeah. Um, so to use that power and to abuse that power in such a way for such a long time and not have been called out on it, I was glad that happened. And I, and I knew that needed to happen. So now I've been just talking with people because know this, even before I sent the letter, we released the letter with 186 signatures on it to begin with, which means that I, even before we released the letter, I sent it to members of the community and said, what do you think about this? Would you sign this? So even then I was trying to think not just about me, but about the community and the stories I'd heard and the responses I'd heard forever from people. But to see the sheer number of responses that came in, uh, I'm still not quite grasping what that means, but I do know it means that it has to change and it has to change now. So 
maybe that person no longer leads to head that organization. Maybe that organization that deals in, in an African, a historically African-American art form needs to have an African-American director. Maybe that organization then needs to look at the relationship with the entire TAP community in Chicago mm-hmm. and say, okay, so now how do we fix this and start reaching out? Like, even in my letter, even in Star's post, we never talked, we never denied that there have been benefits to working with that organization. So I don't, I think it's safe to say that it's probably an important organization, but the way it's been led and ran is, is why we are where we are now. Yeah. And so I, I just think um, that, that the Chicago human rhythm project should seriously take a look at your leadership because if after this outcry from not only the tap community, but members of, of the dance community as a whole, from, I mean, we had people from the theater tech community who have tech shows. We had people who worked in the offices of, like, when the community is that speaks to you that loudly, loudly as an organization, if you don't listen, then, you know, we talk about silence is actually violence because that means you're condoning that behavior. And you're saying, so I think it has to change and it has to change immediately. Like, there needs to be an immediate step down an immediate change of, of, of the director and then a, an immediate, um, I posted just last night, I reposted a letter from the Chicago dance makers forum. That was I their statement. That. that was their statement. But in their statement, they talked about being complicit at times. They talked about what they stood for and how, what they've always tried to stand for. But then they talked about what they were going to change they addressed the issues and said, we're going to do this. We're going to take our money, this big trust that we have, and we're going to put it into a black bank. We're going to start. Da, 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 da. And I think that's what that organization needs to do. That's what like that is the perfect example. That's why I posted it. You know, it, it wasn't that I was endorsing that organization. It was the first time I saw in this whole last week of statements from organizations supporting black lives and black lives matter protests and all of that. It was the first time I saw an organization to me outline, especially an arts organization and a Chicago arts organization outline the changes that they were going to implement immediately. And that's what has to happen. Chicago human rhythm project, I think has to address like there was a lot of things addressed in my letter. Um, uh, they put out a statement, I think yesterday or day before yesterday um, saying that they now saying that they support black lives and they support the protests, but you still didn't address any of the concerns that the community laid at your doorstep. Yeah. And so actions, consequences, tangible, those are the things that, that, that need to happen. Thank you for sharing that, bro. That was powerful. So I got to warn you that we may, in fact, hit butt up against the limit um, a second time. It will cut us off at an hour. Um, so I apologize if we get cut off all of a sudden. If we do, I'll log right back on because I do. I want to finish this. So I wanted to end. I knew that we were going to talk about some t- tough stuff and some difficult stuff. Yeah. I wanted to make sure to end with a couple positive things. One is okay. um, I just wanted to come comment slash compliment uh, the fact that the training that people have received through Mad Rhythms, uh, <laughs> I look at your, I look at the people who come out of it uh, and I consider myself personally a fan of many of, of many of the dancers who have come Thank out you. of Mad Rhythms. Um, you're welcome. Uh, you know, one in particular, I mean, she knows that I fanboy all over her. <laughs> Anytime I see Star, I just lose it because I really, I think she is one of the finest voices in the tap community period right now. Um, yeah, yeah, she so I, just wanted to, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just one of these days she'll figure it out. No, yeah. I, I really, I wanted to make sure to very publicly say uh, just as a fellow member, you know, as a fellow artistic director of a TAP organization, mm-hmm. I really dig you guys. Um, and you. I hope that, I feel like you and I, we, we kind of touched on this when we talked privately. 
I don't know that we necessarily uh, have ever really taken the opportunities we've had uh, mm -hmm. to talk to each other, to share ideas, to stand with each other. Um, we've been on faculty a couple times at different things. or Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I'm looking forward to and that I think is going to happen now because I think we're, we're committed to this mm -hmm. is looking for opportunities and ways that we can support you, uh, mm -hmm. that we can hopefully uh, share resources, share ideas, mm -hmm. uh, certainly even simple things, talking through our season, making sure we don't have shows at the same time, all yeah. these kinds of things. Um, I look forward to really being a uh, member of this community with you in a way that I don't know that we've ever actually been before. Um, I, I, I do. I do as well. So I'm glad that you said that. And yeah, and it starts very simply by us learning how to get together. It shouldn't take somebody from outside hiring us separately. And we end up on faculty together somewhere to have a conversation about what's happening in our city. So you're right there. Ha and, and, you know, and that's what I'm a, a genuine united front has to come out of this. Like the TAP community has now spoken. And now that we're speaking together as a community, like I said, there has to be about five things that we can all agree on that will enable us to have these commonalities. And yeah, so I agree. You know, we should all be at each other's shows supporting. Yeah. We should all be. But if we got them on the same weekends, then obviously we can't do that. Or yep. if you say, I want to do a National Tap Dance Show and Aunt Day Show, and I say, I want to do a National Tap Dance Day Show, and then maybe that can be the one time we present together. Like, well, why yep. not? I love to have people split the cost. I'm, I'm good yep. for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I love like like bringing that. it back. Spoken yeah. like a true artistic director, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you yeah. and me both. <laughs> yeah, we can share costs and split profits. I'm cool with that, especially yeah, in service, and especially in service to the art form. So yeah, 100%, man. Well, you and I are going to have a conversation. Let's start talking about Tap Dance Day next year. Okay. Let's start making that, that happen. I love that. That's, that's beautiful. Yep. yep. Um, and then I will say, so we have a couple things that we normally do at the end of this interview. I think we okay. should still do them. I think okay. if we don't give people the two minute tap lesson, they're going to feel cheated. They're going to be like, look, I sat through two hours of this very difficult, serious conversation about very important issues. And I didn't get my. Two minute tap class. So I feel like if we're, we really should say goodbye and log right back on, because if you start that two minute tap class and get cut off, uh Oh, see, look, that's what I'm saying. All right. I think we're getting cut off right now. So I'm going to hit end and we'll be right back. Please join us. When we come back, um, we're going to have our two minute tap lesson. We're going to have our rapid riffs. And then that. Mark Yonley, founder and artistic director of Chicago Tap Theater, back here with the third and final part of the Tea on Tap. Um, this is a record setting episode. We have, uh, I believe, had more viewers than we've ever had. Uh, we also have talked longer than we've ever had, and I'm so glad we have, because I think we've uh, touched on some really important things. Um, while I wait for Brill to rejoin us, um, again, I'll say hi to a few people. Hey, Doug. Hi, Sarah. I want to say hi to Heather Latakis. Hi, Mom. <laughs> hey, Blair. Um, sorry, you're scrolling by so fast, I can't even tell. Hi, Emily. I see my wife is on here. Hey, Anthony. Thank you for joining us, Anthony. I appreciate it. I've been loving all the things you're doing. Um, and I see Brill is here. So I'm going to have him here. Now. Hey, KDB. All right, here we go. And yes. Yeah, so my phone died. It literally, <laughs> I had plugged it in, but it was using more juice than... Um, it was using more juice than 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 it was supposed to, and it just died. So I went and plugged Sorry. it in with the rapid with the rapid charger. <laughs> and I was just saying, this is record setting. This is the longest episode we've ever had, but it's also the most viewed episode I believe we've ever had um, mm. live. So um, clearly, people are really interested in uh, what's going on, and they're interested in in you and Mad Rhythms. So. Um, mm -hmm. That's cool, man. Well, thank you. So, are you ready for the two-minute tap class? Yeah, yeah, because I was oh, right, the two-minute tap class. Well, now, so here is, here's the thing. That's the one thing I was thinking about that 
I actually didn't want to do today is I don't want to dance yep. because I just wanted to share from my heart and talk today. I dance well, I, all the I, time. I, you talking and, is uh, a lesson. <laughs> so, uh, I, I will say, um, I, I don't know for the class. I, I, it's, I won't, I'm not going to dance today. Um, it's just cause it's where my, my, my spirit is today, but, um, I don't know everything you already doing on the right. Try it on the left. That's, that's my two minutes. <laughs> Run everything today, on the left. I like it. We can call that the two second tap class. Everything yeah, you do yeah. on the right. Everything do you on do the on the right, run it on the left. <laughs> I love it. To my knowledge, Bojangles, Dr. Jimmy Slide, the only two left-footed tap dancers I know. Yep. Um, but I'm left-handed, but all my tap teachers start on to the right, so my right side ended up being stronger than my left side, even though I'm naturally left-side dominant. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to show, yeah, get your left together. Yeah. Like Sammy said in tap, your left foot, you got no <laughs> form. Uh, all right. Are you ready for rapid riff? Yes. All right. These are 10 questions. They're going to come at you fast. Most of these need two or three word answers. Okay. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. God dog it. Now I, now I lost the volume again. Oh, no. I really feel like somebody's granddad. Oh, I don't know what to do with this computer <laughs> thing. What you need is a teenager, Brill. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's, the, that's, the good, that's the good thing about working with young people. I knew yeah. about TikTok before anybody in my age range. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I don't know. That's weird. Can you hear me now? I don't know. I'm trying to see if there's something internally I can do hmm. that'll change it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, there's got to be a way. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh, we're so close to the end. I should have just been happy with where we were and let it go. But I know you all want to hear the rapid riffs. Um, I know I want to hear. I'm really curious. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I'm going to do this fast. All so, right, I, did just, I don't know what I did, but <laughs> it worked. So, bro, I'm going to tell you what I have told every other person I've interviewed on Rapid Riffs. Okay. And I'm going to tell the audience, I give these questions in advance. Uh -huh. So, and yet, almost every interviewee says, oh, that's a hard one. I need to think about it. I'm just going to say, like. Oh, yeah. No, I got this together. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Come on. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Rapid Riffs. And one, what kind of tap shoes do you wear? The uh, Dancing Fair GS1 or the J Sams. Yes. Number two, taps. Tight, Tight. or just a little bit loose? Yeah, you and me both. Three. Did you hear me answer? Wait, wait. Did you hear me answer that before you finish asking? Tell me I didn't read. <laughs> Tell me I didn't read the question. <laughs> Three. Favorite song to tap dance to? And you get one song. I know it's hard. Summertime. Oh, I've seen you dance to Summertime. But Beautiful. specifically, I really love Oscar Peterson's version. Well, one of his versions. He, he's got lots of them, too, but yes. one of his versions. Four, favorite composer? Coltrane. Mm. Uh, count, all right, you're in four, four time. Do you count in fours or eights? Fours. Favorite tap dancer to watch who is no longer with us? Baby. Mm. Favorite living tap dancer to watch? Star Dixon. Yeah, that's a good answer. Favorite <laughs> choreographed tap piece you have seen or done? Seen? Now, this was a hard one only because I was trying to simplify my answer and it's just not working. Um, I will say, you know what? I will say this. The last um, Doris Dance show I saw was pretty friggin' awesome. So I'm going to say a, a, just a Doris Dance show. Fantastic. I forgot, I, I forgot what it was called. It's something to do with the brain, the way you process thought. Was that Myelination, I think? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> nice. Love it.
What single tap performance that you have seen personally do you remember the most vividly? The first time I saw Savion live. Mm. Uh, oh, this is one of my favorite questions. You can go back in time and see any one tap dancer or tap performance. What do you go back and see? Put me in the audience of the Sammy Davis Jr. Variety Show when him and Baby went at each other on stage. Mm. Uh, best venue you've ever played? That's a hard one because there's been a lot of great ones mm. and a lot of not so great ones. <laughs> but you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm going I'm going to just put it out there. I'm going to be shady. My home, the Harold Washington Cultural Center. I love it. That's a great answer. <laughs> Finally. And, and I'm going to tell you, I know how you're going to answer this question. OK, you're not my first mad rhythmer. On this show. <laughs> Second step of the shim sham, what count do you start on? <laughs> you count on the one, baby. You start on All the right. one. So before our final question, I need to thank a few people. Um, I want to thank Leah Koch, our marketing director and tech guru. I want to thank our staff, uh, Molly, Ali, Sarah. Uh, I want to thank our amazing interns, Ali and Emily. I want to thank my beautiful wife, Jennifer Yonley. Um, I want to thank all the dancers at Chicago Tap Theater. I hope you all remember that you're the reason that we're doing all this. Uh, you guys keep me going when I get uh, depressed that we're not able to get together and dance. Um, I want to announce our next guests. Coming up this Sunday, friend of the show and dear friend of Brill, I know, Martin Trey Dumas III. Yes, I cannot wait. Um, next Thursday, we will have Chloe Arnold. So that's going to be an, a, a fun one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friday. Yes, Friday, we are on week two of Book Club with Brenda Buffalino. We are reading her book, Tapping the Source. Um, mm. I know that we're going to be talking about Honey Coles quite a bit this Friday. Yeah, nice, um, nice. And then just a reminder that Heather Cornell is doing uh, footage parties on Sunday, and she's uh, showing some really great footage. I'll talk a little bit more about that on Sunday, because uh, if one wanted, you could easily pop in, watch the interview with Trey, and then go watch footage with Heather. Um, so I want to thank you, Brill, again. But before I thank you formally, mm -hmm. the final shuffle. When you shuffle off this mortal coil, how do you most want to be remembered as a tap artist? To have made a difference in the community and the dance. Like, literally, the term Mad Rhythms. To have made a difference with this art form. Yeah. Well, Brill, there is no doubt in my mind that, that you've already done that and you will continue doing it. I want to thank you so dearly for having been a, a good friend and a good colleague for all these years. Thank you for joining me again. I know that, uh, again, not the easiest thing, right? Talking about race in America is hard. Yeah, yeah. I love that we're having these conversations now. I, I feel the optimism of change in the wind. I feel like mm -hmm. if you and, when you and I talk... Hopefully even next week, we'll be able to talk about the little victories that are happening and how things are moving forward. Um, so thank you for sharing with me. Um, I love you, man. And uh, we'll be talking soon. No doubt, man. It was my pleasure. And, and for everybody, respect the dance. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs> See you on Sunday on the Tea on Tap. Peace. <laughs>